This is American Family News. I'm Steve Jordahl. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi tried to get a proxy voting system without addressing House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy. And it didn't work so well, and she had to pull back. Louisiana Congressman Steve Scalise called her out at a press conference on Wednesday. You saw an effort yesterday by Nancy Pelosi in secret at 2.30 in the morning to drop a document to literally change the way Congress has voted for over 200 years, to go to some proxy system that had never been vetted. Uh, was not a bipartisan effort. Speaker Pelosi is now saying she no longer proposes the proxy voting system. While groups of Democrat governors have resorted to group consensus on how and when they'll begin reopening their states, governors in the South have been taking a little different approach. Governors in the Deep South are saying each state must make its own decision. Georgia Governor Brian Kemp plans to have many of his state's businesses up and running as soon as Friday. Republican Tennessee Governor Bill Lee announced most businesses will begin resuming operations as soon as next week. Some other Republican leaders are taking smaller steps, like reopening their beaches. In the virus hotspot of Louisiana, Democrat Governor John Bell Edwards was also taking a more cautious approach, announcing he'll first allow some non-emergency medical procedures to resume next week. Students for Life of America is suing a university for holding back student fees needed for a campus pro-life group wanting to bring Alveda King to their school. FN's Bob Kellogg reports. SFLA spokesman Matt Lamb says the Georgia Institute of Technology refused the request for funds for King's visit last fall, contending she is inherently religious. Lamb says it's unclear what the student government's reasoning was. Unfortunately, that's why we had to sue them, because they didn't define it and didn't really explain what that means. And I definitely don't believe it's something that a student government should be determining when allocating student funding. Lamb says the event went forward after the school's SFLA members put up the money themselves. In addition to reimbursing the club, he also explains other reasons for filing the suit. And we'd also, you know, really like the students to understand that what they did isn't right. We'd like the university to look at their own policies and look at how they allowed this to happen. Alliance Defending Freedom has filed a suit on behalf of the pro-life group. I'm Bob Kellogg. Climate activist and former Vice President Al Gore has lined up behind Joe Biden's White House bid. He called the election the clearest, most definitive choice in a national election that the United States of America has ever faced. He promised to bring ambivalent fellow climate activists on board. You're not seeing players on the field, but the courts are still going. Major League Baseball has released their findings into claims of sign stealing by the Boston Red Sox two years ago. Fox's John Napolitano has more. Alex Cora has been suspended for the 2020 season by Major League Baseball, but solely for his role in the Houston Astros sign-stealing scandal as the team's bench coach. And they'll be finding that as manager of the Boston Red Sox, Cora and his coaching staff were not aware of anyone illegally stealing signs during the 2018 season, instead pointing the finger at video replay system operator J.T. Watkins for utilizing game feeds in the replay room to revise sign sequence information. As a result, Watkins has been suspended without pay for one year. The Red Sox have been stripped of their second-round pick in this year's draft. Watkins is also barred from serving as a replay room operator for the 2021 season and postseason. Matt Napolitano, Fox News. A Palestinian attacker was shot and killed on Wednesday after he rammed his vehicle into an Israeli checkpoint and stabbed a police officer there. That according to Israeli police. Police spokesman Mickey Rosenfeld said the attack took place near a settlement east of Jerusalem and a sweep of the area found a pipe bomb at the scene. The Israeli policeman was moderately wounded. Video footage of the incident shows the white van veering off the road onto a curb and ramming into the officer. The attacker got out and stabbed the officer with scissors before other policemen shot him dead. The crude oil market settled down a bit. Congress passed a stimulus and corporate earnings came in above expectations. It all had Wall Street in a good mood on Wednesday. The Dow gained 457 points. The Nasdaq gave investors 232 points. And the S&P 500 rose 62 and three quarter points. More news at onenewsnow.com. For American Family News, I'm Steve Jordan.
say you are listening to, you are absolutely listening to the George Espinlove Show coming to you live from the Funny Farm. Now with no further ado, here comes Georgie! Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you very, very much. Oh my goodness, this is Wednesday. I believe that it's Wednesday. I think that it's Wednesday. I'm not really sure. That it's Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> but whatever day it is, thank you for tuning in to the George Espinlove Show. We are live from the Funny Farm, so whether you're down the street, around the corner, across America, or somewhere around this great big world, thank you for taking the time to be with us this evening. We have a delightful show. Remember, we have two goals here in mind. We have two goals in mind here at the Funny Farm. I can tear up the English language, can't I? Man, oh man. I'm so proud of myself sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, Espinlob, you crack yourself up. <laughs> You're goofy as the day is long. Everybody think that? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, any, anyhow, where was I? Oh, we have two goals here in uh, here at the Funny Farm. Goal number one: we want to bring a smile to your face. With all the things that have been going on for the past six weeks or so, my oh my, people are stressed, strained, some people are hurting. We just want to bring a smile to your face this evening, and if we can make you laugh, we'll feel a whole lot better. The other goal is... We want to make you just as goofy as the rest of us. <laughs> I, I told our guest uh, <clears throat> when I was talking to him yesterday off the air, uh, here at the Funny Farm, you are never the same. Once you come, if you decide to leave, most people don't want to leave, but if you decide to leave, you will never be the same again. And there will be an immediate, immediate, realization of your friends and your families and your acquaintances, they will know that something has happened to you. Trust me, they will know. They'll look at you differently. They'll probably look at you a little strange. And so, so many people, when they come, they stay. Others leave, and it's not too long, they come back. And we enjoy having you because we are self-sustained here at the Funny Farm. We've been self-sustained for years. And here in our world, it's a lot safer than it is in yours. So come on in. Call somebody up. Reach out however you reach out with whatever device you reach out with. And tell them the George Espinlove Show is live right now on the air, Spreaker.com. And come in and join the fun. The chat room is open. <clears throat> come in, spend some time with me. Throw some questions up there. Say what you want to say. You know, all those good things. Because I get scared in here all by myself. Uh, of course, I'm not by myself. Charlie is over here to my left running the soundboard. We each have a window here at the studio where we can look out onto the Funny Farm dance floor and see all the shenanigans that's going on out there. And trust me, there's a lot of shenanigans that's going on out there. Look, we want you to get loose. We want you to warm up. We want we don't want nobody to pull muscle now or, you know, stretch your sacroiliac, whatever that thing is. But we want you to get warmed up a little bit 
because we have an exciting guest, and he's going to take us on a journey out of the box, a different way of teaching. And trust me, it is effective. But before we get into that, let's do this. Let's do a little bit of this country stuff. Get loosened up. So get on your feet. Stand on your head and clap your feet if you want to. Uh, if you don't want to, you don't have to. <laughs> but <laughs> Look, there's, there's some people out there on the dance floor that's on their head clapping their feet. All right, we're going to crank up the music. Charlie, you hit it, and let's get loose. <laughs> one more time. Not afraid to bring 
Hello, everyone. This is Claudio Rosano. Tune into my show, The Claudio Rosano Show, where I will be interviewing sports legends of the 70s, 80s, and 90s, as well as talking sports with some old friends. You can hear us on ClaudioRosano.com. That's C L A U D I O R E I L S O N O.com. And now at 4 p.m. on Fridays and 9 a.m. on Mondays at the George Espen Lobb Show on Facebook. All right, you can listen to Claudio, 4 p.m. on Friday afternoon and 9 a.m. on Monday morning right here on the George Espen Lobb Show. We want you to send us an email, George C.E., that's George C.E. at Comcast.net, George C.E. at Comcast.net, and as I always say, we will answer each and every one of them just as we always have, <clears throat> excuse me, just as we are doing, and just as we will continue to do in the future. And I encourage you to go to the Espen blog. That's T-H-E-E-S-P-N-B-L-O-G dot com. The Espen blog dot com. You can read all about the funny farm. See the articles up there. Uh, Mr. Ed Temple. <coughs> has a space on our blog now. It's called Ed Says, or Ed Said. That's what it was. Ed Said. Uh, Sometimes I can't get nothing. It's not funny either, gang. Uh, But anyhow, visit the EspenBlog.com. There are some interesting things on there, and you can get to know each and every one of the characters that make up this bunch here at the Funny Farm. So email me, GeorgeCE at George C.E. at Comcast.net. Oh, man. I'm thinking about too many things at once. George C.E. at Comcast.net and visit us at the Espenblog.com. You can also go to the George Espen Lobb Show on Facebook. There you can see all of our live videos that we have done thus far. Uh, We have started it back in October. I think October 11th was the first one that we did. And you can see each and every show that we did, and you can watch it at your pleasure. So please do that. The George Espenlob Show on Facebook. We're going to let you get warmed up one more time. We want you to tap your foot, snap your fingers, bob your head, and shake your booty. And then... We're going to bring Mr. Alex Tasker on board. Get it done now.
Wow. <laughs> I could just see you in your living room, in your kitchen, out on the porch, out on the deck, moving about, and you were tapping your feet, snapping your finger, bobbing your head, and shaking your booty. That's what it's all about, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to take you into the audio portion of a show that we did yesterday afternoon on the George Espinlove Show. We went live into Facebook, and we went live into Twitter. We had a tremendous response. A young man that, uh, well, I just say that he's brilliant. He's a brilliant young man. I was impressed. Mr. Alex Tasker, he teaches here at the Laurel High School in Laurel, Delaware. He teaches history. And he has a different approach to teaching his students. I call it outside the box. Not only will you hear how he approaches teaching, he will take us all on a journey way back in history, long before any one of us were ever here. And he will be discussing some things with us that is bound to make you think. And isn't that what learning is all about? It'll make you think. Not what somebody wants you to think, but it'll make you think on your own. Ladies and gentlemen, go with me now into the audio portion of yesterday's show with Mr. Alex Tasker. <laughs> All right, Ed, we're live. We're just waiting for Alex to get back in at the last minute. He froze up. Yeah. And it's not even cold outside. But anyhow, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, friends, Romans, and countrymen, whether you're down the street, around the corner, across America, or somewhere around this great big world, thank you for tuning in this afternoon to the George Espinlob Show with my friend, Ed Temple. Ed, how you doing? Doing pretty good. Been a busy morning, but, uh, you know, it's always good to be on the show. It's always good to be the sidekick. Oh, no, no, no. Oh. You're, 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 you're the equal. You, oh. There he is. All right, there we go, guys. We good? Yes, we're good. You, All right, there we go. I'm using my phone. We're good now, man. Now, you're not, you're not re- a little old. You're not related to Steve Tasker, are you? The kicker? No, the, uh. I think his name was Steve Tasker, the the special teams guy that used to play. Uh, I want to say he was on yeah, the Bills. The Bills. There you go. Bills, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Somewhere, uh, somewhere down the line, I am man. Uh, <laughs> my uh, my dad and his three brothers are uh, you know, the Can- the Canadian Lacrosse Hall of Fame, actually. Oh wow! So it runs in the family. I didn't make it, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I understand. my brother was pretty good at hockey. But yeah, I played in high school, but that was about it. So. Well, have you, ever, you, ever, you ever seen George dance? He didn't make it either. I don't think so. (laughs) And I just needed more room, man. That's all. That's all. But, ladies and gentlemen, Alex Tasker. Tasker. Come on, Espen Lobb. Get it right. Alex Tasker is our guest this afternoon. But first, we have to do this. As soon as I find him, where'd he go? There he is. You know who he is. Here comes dude. And Alex, that is the star of our show. I love it, man. Little little enter Sandman. My uh, if my cousins are watching, they'll appreciate that. <laughs> friends, good Romans stuff right there. Thank you for What's tuning. That? In. No, I said friends, Romans, and countrymen. Thank you for tuning in, and that's the show for today. Uh, we'll see you next time. Oh no, I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. 
<laughs> we have with us Mr. Ed Temple. Everybody knows Ed. He's always getting me in trouble one way or another. Sometimes he gets me in trouble, and I actually think I'm in trouble. Uh, and then other times he gets me in trouble, and I know I'm in trouble. And sometimes he gets me in trouble, <clears throat> and I keep hoping he gets me out of trouble, but he messes with me. It takes a long time to get me out of trouble. If you understood all that, you're more scarier than I am. But our guest today is Alex, Alex Tasker, from right here in Laurel, Delaware, and he teaches at the Laurel High School. Alex, welcome to the show. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me on. Um, just want to give some quick shout outs to the kids that are watching. Love you guys. Miss you. Um, staff that's watching. Love you guys too. Miss you. Um, you know, Laurel's really, it's a great place to work. It's got great kids, good people. Um, and I'm not just saying that to say that because I'm on air and they're watching. Um, it really is. They're, they're good people. And I mean that. And um, done a lot of good things there. Um, the uh, high school administration is doing a great job right now of making sure everything rolls out as smoothly as it possibly can with this unprecedented uh, situation we're in. And, uh, you know, the, the superintendent and the assistant superintendent have done a great job since they got there. Um, you know, he came there about five, six years ago and our scores were low, man. They were like at the bottom of the state. And uh, since he's been there, um, you know, we've we've got everything up to about state average or better. So. They're really doing some great things. It's a, it's a good thing to be a part of. It is. So. I think you know this fella. I do. There he is, man. I hope he's doing well. <laughs> I, miss, I miss having him in class. He's one of those, uh, man, he can, uh, he can talk with you about some interesting stuff. Yeah, he, he sure can. Very uh, mature kid. He's a, uh, he's a pistol for lack of a better term. Uh, yeah, yes, he is. But anyhow, uh, Alex, yeah, you teach in a different way, or you have a different approach. I call it outside the box. Uh, I would agree with that. Outside the box, we can go with that. Where you uh, you give both sides of the story, that which is in the textbook, and that which isn't in the textbook. That's, you want to explain that's very, that? very correct. Yep. Very correct. Yeah, I'll explain it. Um, so I think it gives the kids, you know, it, it taps into that, to that rebel that's in teenagers, right? Um, when you give them something and you say, look guys, this, this isn't in the textbook. Okay. But I'm going to show it to you anyway. Right. Um, they start asking immediately. I mean, I don't even have to ask the question. Why is this not in the textbook, Mr. Tasker? Why aren't, why is it in there? And, um, you know, from right there, you got them. Um, <laughs> they want to learn stuff that's not typically taught in the school. Um, it's interesting to them. And, uh, you know, when we really get going with uh, discussions and conversations about some pretty deep topics, um, you know, that's when I, my energy gets flowing, man. And I, I really, uh, I get that intuitive feeling like this is what I'm supposed to be doing with my life. You know, it's, uh, it's a really cool experience. I love it. Um, I'm really glad I got into it. And uh, it's just, uh, you know, it's a good thing to be doing. It's a good thing to be doing. Ed? Uh, I, th I think that's uh, absolutely right. I, we've had um, Mr. Osborne, I, who I feel is probably the one of the nation's best um, scientists that is teaching in a public school. And he, uh, one of his um, uh, findings in his research is that, for example, when they teach one theory, you get a certain number of learners. And you teach a different theory, you get a certain number of learners. But when you teach two opposing theories they actually learn more of both theories and so absolutely. i guess that's consistent with what you're saying absolutely ed um and i saw your guys show with him on there uh last week and um i was just nodding my head when you guys were talking about that stuff that's uh makes perfect sense to me that's perfect probably sense. the first time somebody nodded their head watching it that's good <laughs> they usually go like this yeah, no, I was I was watching that, and I was like, I think I'm in the right place to do this podcast. So. That's what they usually say. <laughs> <laughs> That's the word on the street, right, Ed? That, that is. <laughs> <laughs> I was saying, uh, uh, Dax, Dax Brown, he's up there in Canada. Uh, I think it's British Columbia. Uh, good morning, George. Walter sent me and says hi. Uh, there's a joke behind that, but uh, – 
I'm glad to see you're doing well, Dax. Uh, who else we got? Ah, we, 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 we got the main part here. Right there. We got the main part. Uh, <laughs> that's the one. That's she how you comes, keep the marriage strong. That's right. Almost 50, yeah, you got to get her up there. <laughs> now, almost 52 years now. Sure. Uh, wow. That, that is a strong, blessed, anointed woman, I'm telling you. <laughs> to, to put up with this character for well, almost 52 Mr. years. Mr. Tasker said he has two sides of the story, right? Right. <laughs> well, I think he least, might have at a least two sides. Side. <laughs> yeah, you told at me. At least two sides, right. <laughs> you told me your second side, Ed. <laughs> wow. And there's Melissa Howard. Hello, Melissa. Uh, glad to have you. Wow. Uh, see what I mean, Alex? He, he's for all the time trying to get me in trouble. So he is. Uh, man, where was I? My train fell completely off the track. My, oh, my, oh, my. When, when you, let me, let me say it this way. When I'd be hanging out with the kids over the years and certain, certain days would come up, for instance, uh, in November when president Kennedy was assassinated mm-hmm. or Pearl Harbor or, uh, some of the other things, I would ask the kids, <clears throat> did they say anything about such and such today? Uh, uh-uh. <laughs> That's a, uh-uh. uh-uh. I'd say, really? No, Mr. George, you're, no, uh-uh. They didn't. And <clears throat> it makes me spit sideways because in a lot of cases, they're not teaching uh, history as we were taught history, are they, Alex? Uh, there are, yeah, I, I don't really um, see that too much at Laurel. I really don't. Um, but there are uh, curriculums that don't cover certain things and uh, because of whatever's on the test, maybe at the end of the year or something like that. Um, you know, it's uh, it's just one of those realities, you know, if the stuff's on the test or it's not, that's, uh, you know, motivation for it some curriculum. So just how it goes. Wow. Ed? Yeah. Yeah. I just, uh, like I said, I think that, um, you know, when you're making things more interesting to learn, they're, you're going to learn more. That's just the way it is. And, and like you said, what they've been seeing in these books, these books, they just, here's a math book. It never, there's no reason to buy a new math edition. I mean, it's the same stuff, but the point is though, that, you know, the, the material in the book, you know, the, with a few revised editions, they change, tweak a little bit here and a little bit there. But it, but but Mr. Tasker is absolutely correct that the kids are going to be more interested when you go off a script. I give you an example. One of the first years I was, uh, or because I, I student taught more than one year, uh, but uh, I, I was so bad at it. No, just kidding. But uh, but I actually was doing it early, early, earlier than I was supposed to. And so a teacher said, I'll let you come in my class and teach. He says, I don't like giving up my class. And this isn't really your, you know, your internship in the first place, but he'll let me do it. And so what he, what he, he, he gave me some analysis of how I was instructed and what I, and what he noticed was, see, at first I was reading from this notebook, you know, and I said, yeah, and I'd go through the lesson. And as soon as I put the notebook down, all of a sudden I have their attention. You know, so that, that that taught me a lot. So the bottom line is when you go off script, people actually pay attention. You know, when, when you're sticking with just the script, nothing wrong with the script. Don't get me wrong. But, you know, when you going off the script is when things get more in, interesting and, and, it, and when, when it becomes more personal. Right. Yeah. And if if you think it's boring, um, the kids are going to think it's boring, obviously. So you have to adjust uh, accordingly with that. What are some of the things? <clears throat> what are some examples of of some of the items or some of the details that that you would discuss in in your classroom? Uh, <laughs> this in the book, that not in the book. Okay. Um, all right. Well, we, are you trying to get me into trouble here, George? What are you trying to do? No, no. I'm I'm just <laughs> some examples. Just... I'm just kidding. Okay. Um, well, I guess first of all, let's let's go with the with JFK, right? Um, 
it's pretty well accepted that the official uh, government story we got was not really what happened, right? I mean, that's pretty much public knowledge by this point, but it's still not technically, you know, in the books. So I provide uh, some details that uh, are not included, such as, you know, I mean, apparently the guy who tried to assassinate the president used the, uh, the worst rifle in history with one of the worst ballistic bullets in history. I mean, the thing had a round nose on it. They used to fire them and they would start somersaulting, you know? I mean, that's, that's one of the things, um, see, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure how far I, I should, uh, go with this stuff. I mean, we get into the banking system. I mean, uh, JFK signed an executive order. It was uh, 00001 in uh, June, and that was to get rid of the Federal Reserve Bank and go back to like an actual, like tangible based uh, currency with silver and gold. Um, that's not in the history books either. So that's that's the kind of stuff I pull. It's not that it's it's not even conspiracy. It's just it's just facts that aren't presented in the textbook. Right. You know. So it's just it's just a different side of the story. Um, the way it is. So let, let me let me <clears throat> I don't want to get Zacchaeus up a tree. Uh but anyhow, let let me say it this way. I was fifteen years old when President Kennedy was assassinated. Okay. I was sitting in the last period <clears throat> of my uh sophomore English class when the announcement came over to the intercom. And so <clears throat> As things started to develop, unravel, whichever way you want to look at it, it didn't take long for word on the street for people to say, nah, this is, this is just coming along too smooth. Uh, you know, in two hours, you got your guy, you got this... <clears throat> rickety old weapon you got this you got that you have a police officer shot you arrest them in a theater and it goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on yeah on sunday when we came home from church we walked in turned the television on because that that was that's all that was there and i think at the time we had two maybe three channels but it was on all three NBC, CBS, and ABC. Okay. And we watched. This was the first time that America ever saw anything happen in real time on television as they brought him from upstairs in the Dallas Police Department down to the parking garage where they were going to transport him to a different jail. And we watched as Jack Ruby walked through the crowd, stuck a pistol in this guy, and we all know what happened from that time on <clears throat> more and more excuse me <clears throat> and more people knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that now i hear the narrative but it's not jiving up the way the narrative what they're saying you know we got our guy we got the guy that killed president kennedy blah 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 and on and on and on and on and on and for years, you know, they had the uh, the Make Fast Warren Commission. And, yeah, you know, uh, one man, three shots, uh, you know, the magic bullet, and this and that and other things. No matter, no matter what people saw, no matter what people heard, don't matter what was on film, don't matter as far as ballistics goes and all these other things, <clears throat> this is how it went down. So, yes. Uh, I know exactly what you're saying. There's an interesting thing here that, that I want to share with people. Uh, let me find it. Because <clears throat> Alex has a, uh, what we call it, Alex. I know it's a tattoo. But yeah, that'll be a, that'll be a good segue into this, uh, segment. Um, yeah. what's the word for it? Is, is it a uh, there it is you tell us what that is all right so what you have going on there first of all i uh about eight years ago i uh had to make a change in my life that required you know uh 
a uh, change in attitude and change in, uh, in spirit, basically. All right. So I got really into spirituality and consciousness and all this kind of stuff. Um, I tried to edit that photo a little better so it didn't show so much and just show the tattoo, but that's fine. Um, so what you have there is the lotus flower. Um, I, I just got really into ancient Egyptians um, when I started getting into spirituality because there's a lot of stuff there that's not talked about that they really knew about, and uh, it's really cool stuff. But the lotus flower there at the bottom is their symbol for rebirth because it only uh, blooms during the daytime when the sun hits it, then it goes back underwater at night. So you can see the resemblance there for rebirth. Um, you got the two hands there right above it. That symbol is Ka in uh, ancient Kemet in Egypt. Um, that's their symbol for the physical projection of the spirit, which is the personality. In the top left there, you got uh, what looks like a sun disk, and that's the um, represents the cycle of Aten, where the sun is during the day. We'll get into that, but um, that's the uh, highest stage of consciousness, like spiritual enlightenment. And then, of course, you have the pyramids, and there's five there. And um, so the ancient the civilization that apparently created these things. Um, Secondly, known as Kemet. Um, Kemet means the black land, that soil, that black soil that used, they used to get when the Nile would flood. Um, that's where they got the name for their civilization. And they believed everything was in fives. All right. So yet they had the five houses, which were just structures. Um, in their language, it was called Perka, which is the tomb, Perba, which is the temple, Perwer, which was the school. Per, per Netter, which meant house of energy. And Netter is actually where you get the Greek word nature from. Um, and also per ah, which is where the word Pharaoh comes from. If you can see that resemblance yeah. there. Um, now technically this goes against basically every single textbook you see out there, but, um, this is according to indigenous wisdom keepers from Egypt, all right, from their tribes that technically there was no male Pharaoh ever. That word was meant for the high house was for the woman. Okay. They were a matrilineal society. It was not run by males. Um, and the woman chose who the king was. So he was the king, but she was the pharaoh. So we look at it through our lens um, of Western society, and we are a patrilineal society, right? Everything's male-dominated. Um, everything's left-brain thinking. And uh, they just were a very different civilization. And according to these you know, indigenous wisdom keepers, they had a very good society. There was no war. Um, imagine that, right? It's, it's interesting to think about that. Everything being run by a woman being so different like that right i mean especially as a male you can make kind of makes you wonder like hmm um maybe it was bad that we made that switch but uh yeah we, i mean we could talk for hours about that just alone but um that uh then with that too yeah there are five cycles of the sun um which was keter ra un un's where we get noon from that's when the sun's right where it at where it's at when uh when it's noon time and then aten and amen um so they believed everything was in cycles of five all right. And uh, they also believe this is going to sound crazy and people will give it a chance. Uh, they believe that we had we were born with 360 senses, not just the five that were commonly taught. OK, that sounds pretty out there. But uh, if you think about it, though, it's really not. So your intuition, right? Those thoughts you get that tell you, you know, I, sh I should be doing this. I probably shouldn't be doing that. Maybe that was one of their senses. Um, that energy you can feel when you go into a room right when it's you can feel the tension or anxiety or love i mean we, you can physically feel that your body has a reaction to that um we send off you know magnetic waves to people through our heartbeat and our brain picks it up like we can actually communicate with people without communicating so it's really not that far-fetched if, if you look into it so but they believe everything's in fives and that'll come up later ed it's fascinating um so just to go back can you give an example of something that came in fives? That, that What's an in five? For example, five pyramids? Is that what you're talking about? Or? Yeah, so there's five main periods, main pyramids of Giza, then the five houses that I mentioned, um, the tomb, the temple, the school, house of energy, and the high house where the, the woman lived, the leader, and then the five cycles of the sun. Um, and Ra is commonly associated as the sun god, but it's really not just one god, okay? We're talking about teachings that were before organized religion. So it was just part of a cycle. Um, so there's five cycles of the sun where it literally is um, in the day. And then also five stages of consciousness that are directly related with the cycles of the sun. So if you were at Aten, 
you were at the most enlightened stage. And if you go down, you were less enlightened. And then Amen is total darkness. So those are uh, three examples of stuff that they, they chose to have in fives. So let me see if I get this right. When you was talking about the senses, I was sitting there thinking, yeah, that's been a lot of, you don't have no sense. So you don't got to worry about, <laughs> look at that. He's quick to agree. You don't have to worry about five or 360. It don't make no difference. But so the, the women, <laughs> thanks, Ed. Uh, the women, are you saying that they picked the Pharaoh? Or no, they so, were the Pharaoh was the woman. The Pharaoh was the woman, right. That was the term given to the leader, but they only called the woman that. And then we went, and I'm, all this stuff is from like indigenous um, tribal people from Egypt, which is left out in mainstream Egyptology and archaeology. They don't account for the... Uh, oral tradition like we account for that here in the united states right you have oral traditions from all kinds of tribes and everything right they just totally didn't even acknowledge that so all the stuff i'm telling you is not just off the top of my head you know it's it's from people that actually have wisdom passed down so so they were like outsiders these people i mean as far as far as the as far as the history part goes Correct. Yes. I mean, the land of Kemet, the civilization of Kemet, it's uh, K-H-E-M-E-T. It's, I mean, you, it, information's out there. It's just not mainstream. Um, that's basically the way to sum it up. It's just not mainstream. You never hear about it. You just hear ancient Egypt. You never hear about the land of Kemet. So, because they all used to be green around there when the pyramids are. It used to be very lush land. Um, and that's what they lived off of. So. Ed? You you got that look on your face? Uh yeah. This is a so uh, just to be what what um, what era are we talking about here? What's the you know the the date or do we have a date? Right. So we do have some dates. Um, this is what goes against mainstream too. This is theory, obviously, but they're saying that the dates for the Comitian civilization go back as far as thirteen thousand years. So you're talking before dynastic Egypt with all the dynasties and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And so, um, and then until when do, do we know? So that's, that's where it gets interesting. Um, so they're finding more evidence now that a cataclysmic event might've happened around 12,800 years ago. Um, I should have done more research on this before I came on, but they are finding evidence. Um, and if you look at all the traditions in the whole entire world, they all have a story. I'll call it a story, because I don't think it's a myth, of a flood. Um, So that is part of the explanation why they might have had very superior technology, possibly. I mean, it's possible. And then that information was lost after the flood. And then here we sit now, and we think as people that we're the most advanced people to ever live on the Earth. And there's a lot of evidence coming out right now that would suggest otherwise. Let me ask so. you this. What about what have you ever heard of Egyptians talking about um, living with dinosaurs? I have never went down that path. No. OK. I know that I, Os, Mr. Osborne has uh, got a he hasn't finished any of his books, but he's got a bunch of books that he started writing. And, and some of which are some of those ancient societies like uh, in different parts of Asia, as well as uh, in different parts of Africa, they have all kinds of uh, things that they've etched in stone and, and that, that uh, were images of, of humans with, with uh, dinosaurs. But anyway, so I just, I just wondered if that was part of the, uh, this Egyptian history. Alex, you mentioned something interesting. <clears throat> and I, I, I have always said this, of course, when Espelob says something, they just look at me like, yeah, okay, whatever, you know, <clears throat> Uh, just go over there to sit in the corner. We'll get back to you later. But I have always thought, you don't have to laugh, Ed. Uh, <laughs> see what I mean? I've always thought that man at one time was much more intelligent than we are now. Right. So it's not linear. Right. Yeah. You know, people nowadays like to think that, that, that 
we're going upward. You know, we're we're down here in the low spot, and then as we climb up, we get smarter and smarter and smarter and smarter. You know, to where we're at right now. I think it was just the opposite. I think we were up here somewhere, and it's just been downhill, downhill. I don't think we know. Now, we know a lot, but I don't think we know as much as people think we know. Does that make any sense to you? Absolutely. I would uh, 100% agree with that. Yeah, 100%. I think it's more of a uh, cycle than a linear path upwards like uh the mainstream uh, archaeology and historians suggest. Um, I think it's definitely more of a cycle. For instance, and I guess I guess I could show people some of these pictures. <clears throat> if I didn't put these in order, Alex, you you uh, <laughs> you just holler at me, and I'll, I'll. All right, it's it's okay. If you didn't, we'll just talk about them, and we'll just keep going. It's not a big deal. All right, this is the inside of of what? That is one of the pictures of the inside of the Great Pyramid in uh, Giza, Egypt. It's the biggest one there. Um, now, if you notice, it's a little dark, but do you see any hieroglyphs or any writings on the walls or anything? I don't. No. Shouldn't be able to, right? Um, so that's that's just my first point. I don't want to, like, reveal everything at, at first. But um, so there's no – that's just one picture, of course. I don't know if you have the other ones. But uh, anybody that's been in there – there's another one. Okay. Um, anybody that's been in this pyramid, whether it's a scientist um, – archaeologist, tourist will tell you there's no hieroglyphs or any markings in the Great Pyramid. And when I'm talking about scientists, I'm talking about former NASA scientists um, and uh, that have been in there. And, well, I'll get to that in a second when we go to the next pictures. But Okay. Can we get the right one? So, yeah, there's, there's, that's all I want. There's, yeah, there's another one. So there's no, there's no hieroglyphs or anything like that in the Great Pyramid of Giza. Okay. All right. Now. So this picture, yeah, here we go. All right, so this is uh, from a tomb in Egypt. All right, notice it's very decorated. Um, there's drawings on the walls. There's statues, all kinds of stuff there, right? Um, if you keep going to the next two pictures, there's another one. That's beautiful. Um, got all kinds of colors and stuff there. Now, they say that they wrote, like, spells and stuff on the walls and any information that uh, they would want these – uh, powerful people to have when they got to the afterlife and all that kind of stuff. So they, they decorated it. You know, it was their uh, their place of burial. Um, it was the last one. I mean, it was just beautiful work they did with this stuff. I mean, it's magnificent what they were able to do back then. Um, so those are pictures from tombs, right? So you take the pictures from the Great Pyramid. There's no markings, hieroglyphs, anything in there. And all of their tombs have markings and hieroglyphs everywhere. All right. There's a one of the NASA scientists that's been in there and done a lot of research, his name's Christopher Dunn. He does a, he's got this whole thing online, the Giza power plant and everything. He went in there and he said, look, from being in here, it just, it looks like something you would not want to be in when it's on. Okay. So he's, there's a, trust me, there's a lot of research on this stuff. Um, so technically that would be like us decorating our oven. You see what I'm saying? Our oven? Right. Our oven, right. Because, why? Would, you know, because you wouldn't want to be in there when it's on. Why would you decorate it? That's okay. Cool. So they look nothing like any other tombs in Egypt, like any tombs. What you thinking, Ed? Why do you think that is? I think because they were used for a different purpose. Um, we're going to get into that in a little bit here. Uh there is evidence to suggest that they were used for some kind of electric electric uh, conductivity and they were not originally intended to be tombs. Fair enough. Is this going Fair over enough, your head, right? George? No. Is this no. going like this, George? Nope. Nope. <laughs> the picture should help. We when we get into this, it's it, it's sticking it. It's sticking. <laughs> to the one half brain cell. In my one half brain cell. Look, that puppy's firing this afternoon. <clears throat> so one 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 more uh, thing real quick about tombs. So they've never found any bodies in these great pyramids either, I guess. Okay. So no bodies either. Um it's another thing that should be talked about. All right. Let's see. What do we got here? Is this this the one? We got there. Okay, yeah. So that's um when I when I present this in class, I always ask the kids first, their warm up when they come in the classroom is 
who invented electricity or who discovered it? All right. And what do you think they say? Edison. Yeah, who originally discovered it, right? Benjamin Franklin, right? right? Um, this is called the Baghdad Battery. It was found in Baghdad, Iraq in 1936. Um, and they've dated it to be about 2,000 years old. Okay. So you got the copper and um, electrical conductivity going on there. And the next picture, if you go to that real quick, there it is. So that's the way this thing worked. Um, it was a battery. They've tested them. All you need to do is you put a little bit of a, any kind of citrus uh, juice at the bottom of it, and you can conduct an a, uh, electrical charge. So they literally have um, ironclad proof that they knew about electricity about 2,000 years ago. But we still are under the notion that Benjamin Franklin discovered it in the late 1700s or mid 1700s. Let me ask you something, Alex. <clears throat> yeah. This Baghdad battery that we're looking at. <clears throat> yes. Has, has anyone replicated one exactly like that? And, and, and if so, how much juice does it put out? Um, they definitely have replicated them. I'm not sure about the uh, voltage or anything that they do put out. I don't think it's that great, though. I don't think it's that great. It's not like it could, like, uh, you know, power a house or anything like that. But just think about your brain there, Mr. Espenlob. It's just not firing on all cylinders. So you're uh, – <laughs> so this could possibly light a light bulb. Yeah, I would say so. Um it would be really cool to know what, you know, they actually used it for. But, uh, I mean, it's definitely, I mean, it's proof that they knew about electricity 2,000 years ago. That's wild. That's wild. Is is this this Baghdad battery, <clears throat> have they found any other materials that go along with a battery, uh, such, such as some kind of electrical device that, this thing could operate or no not not that i'm aware of um it's uh i mean this stuff could be out there it's just i mean if it was discovered in 1936 i just it's it's kind of frustrating that there's not more you know attention on it and uh like there is some other things so i mean i think that's a pretty significant finding like that should be mainstream information i would i would say so that is interesting i'd, I'd like to see someone come up with with whatever that battery was for i'd like to see you know what i'm saying uh hey if there's if there's science teachers out there looking for a project there's one for you right there yeah yeah wow that's awesome so then we come to this right so the pyramid door. This is a, yeah this is a view of one of the doors um when they were in motion and working um first of all there were 20 tons Okay. And apparently you could push them open with your hand. That's how well they were engineered. Um, they've not been operable for quite a bit. And that's all based on um, people from at least 500 years ago looking at them. But, uh, you know, that's what they say. The, the key is, though, not if it can be moved with your hand or how much it weighs or any of that stuff, though. The, the point is, Tombs didn't have doors on them. They weren't meant to be visited and stuff. They put everything inside, and then that was it. Um, they weren't. It's not like today where we go visit graves and stuff. You didn't go in the tomb after that. That was it. They sealed it off. So the fact that there's a door on there, two doors actually, um, it's a little, that's just a closer up uh, picture of it there. Um, so just very, very interesting that you have these things so far that don't uh, – resemble tombs in any way um and we're just really getting started so these these pyramids yeah they're humongous right they are they that great pyramid alone contains 2.3 million stones they are an average of two tons each and we literally cannot replicate that exact pyramid or anything close to its size we literally cannot do it so, I mean, it's pretty obvious that they knew something, right? I mean, even with all of our ingenuity, uh, the high tech tools, 
we can't replicate what they can't do, do. it. That, and that, that, that there alone is mind boggling. Uh, right. I, I mean, it's raises some definite questions. It sure does. It sure does. All right. Let's, let's look at this. Okay. Now, so yeah, you got now and then there, um, when they were originally created, they had a, uh, they had limestone on the outside. Okay, you can still kind of see that there is some left at the top there on that left picture. Um, what happened was about 300 years ago, it was getting so bad falling off that they just repurposed the limestone for other things. Um, they do that a lot with these stones and uh, other rocks in Egypt, unfortunately. But um, so limestone acts as an insulator. Uh, it's not the best one, but it does not trap heat in it. It slowly lets it out. Okay, so... I mean, is there a reason they put the limestone on there? Was it, did it have something to do with electricity? I guess that's debatable, but they did, in fact, um, insulate it with limestone on the outside. And it's theorized that the cap of it was gold. It's missing now, which could make sense, uh, considering it was gold. So, but they can't prove that. Because gold is obviously another great uh, conductor of electricity. So. Wow. So, that's how it looks now. <clears throat> Right. And, and this is supposedly how it looked in the beginning, right? Supposedly how it looked in the beginning. And uh, I mean, the pyramid, it's not just the limestone. I mean, they have, uh, you got dolomite, which increases electrical conductivity, depending on how much pressure you put on it. Uh, there's granite in there. All the passageways are lined with granite. Okay. Granite is slightly radioactive. Uh, there's high amounts of quartz crystal in there. Um, anybody who's got a battery on their watch quartz crystal you know if you just shake it back and forth you can charge it um the granite also ionizes the air inside the pyramid and which increases the uh conductivity of electricity so is it possible that they just put all this stuff in there just because they thought it looked nice sure that's possible i just uh along with many others believe that they were used for uh you know something other than than a tomb. Mr. Taster, what are you trying to do? Get the kids to think this is not good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're, uh, I do get them to think. Um, I present stuff to them like this all the time. And I mean, as you can see, it's not, it's all fact based. I mean, it, they're, the stuff's literally made out of all that stuff. Um, it all conducts electricity. I mean, it's possible. They, I'll put it this way. There's more evidence that these things had something to do with electricity than, the, than there is that they were tombs. So all the, all the tombs, uh, the pyramid tombs, right. they, they were sealed up, no entrance, nothing. But these, Correct. these had doors. So, so they were, they were made for something specific if they had a door on it, right? Right, exactly, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it's it sounds crazy to a lot of people, but I mean, I've been looking at this stuff for years now and looking at lots of uh, independent archaeologists and scientists, and I mean, it's really, when you watch their stuff, I mean, it's just absolutely fascinating. I mean, there's a document, I don't know if it's on Netflix anymore, but it's called The Pyramid Code, and it's the basically the most mainstream this stuff has ever been. Um, great, great documentary. I, I highly recommend people watch it. They explain it a lot better than I do. I can tell you that. Wow. Ed? Well, the bottom line is that uh, are you trying to tell me that the books don't contain all the information that kids could, and, and adults for that matter, that would uh, make the, the material a plenty more interesting and certainly would give the kids – some creative extension. Right. I mean, so, you know, whether it was used for electricity or not, um, you know, it's definitely more interesting, right? I mean, you talk about all this crazy stuff about electricity and these people are supposed to be, you know, we, we basically call them cavemen and stuff, right? I mean, they, there's no way they could have any kind of technology that we don't have, right? Um, here's, here's a little something from the, uh, a college textbook about the pyramids, all right? Real quick. The largest and most magnificent Magnificent of all the pyramids was built under King Khufu about uh, 4,500 years ago. It was a tomb. 
um, it expressed the, uh, you know, the royalty and all that kind of stuff. I mean, that's all it says about the pyramids. And there's two paragraphs in a college level history textbook. <laughs> that's it? Yeah. That's, that's literally all it says. There's, there's two paragraphs. So what got you interested in all this? So, uh, when I was, um, trying to make some changes in my life, I got really into spirituality and, uh, consciousness and all this stuff. And these people kept popping up when I was doing the research. And I was like, what are these, at first I was like, what are these people talking about? These ancient people having higher consciousness and maybe being able to do stuff that we couldn't do. And it just, it steamrolled from there, man. Um, it just, uh, I mean, can you imagine like we use about 10 to 20% of our brain at any, any given time, right? So this is a theory, of course, but what not if these people, not George, not George, not George. <laughs> not George. <laughs> okay. All right. But what if, what if these people were using a lot more of their brains at that time? Oh. Like it's a, it's a, what if, of course, but right. if they were, it could explain maybe they knew how to do some things that we don't know how to do. So. Well, you might be going against the whole Prussian education model uh, if you keep on trying to get these kids to think. This is scary stuff here. You're gonna, instead of <laughs> producing the George Espen lobs, you might start producing some, you know, some <laughs> cures for things. You know, you, I don't know. We, we may not be sitting here talking about the yeah. coronavirus. I don't know. <laughs> no. Yeah, it's uh, the kids love this stuff, man. I mean, they they do. Sometimes they get annoyed because I talk about it too much, but. Uh, they do. They, they like learning about stuff that's not mainstream. They get it. They're smart. Now, the Egyptians were well advanced in medicine, well advanced in mathematics. Somebody had, yeah, to, that's really... somebody had to know something to build these things uh, when, it, when it comes to the mathematics and so on and so forth. Uh, Correct. Yeah. Um, well, the Pythagoras, right? Pythagorean theorem. He, he attended. I'm, I'm not going to say he got his formula from them, but he did attend um, Egyptian mystery schools. So there's definitely a possibility there that he picked up some stuff up there. I mean, it's, it's possible. It's definitely possible. Wow. Interesting. Interesting. So where are you going to go with this? What's, what's the, what's the end game with all of the, all this uh, um, alternative uh, viewpoint? So the end game is, you know, you want kids to question stuff, all right? You don't want them to just sit there in life and just take everything as gospel um, just because, you know, somebody on TV says it or somebody that we elected says it or, you know, you want them to question stuff. Um, I'm big on uh, Einstein's quote. I always got like three million of them. Um, but he said that education is what remains when you forgot what you learned in school. So let's be honest. I mean, most of the kids aren't going to remember a lot of the stuff we teach them in the actual classroom and the content. I mean, I think that would be impossible to remember all that information. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but the way they think is going to remain with them for the rest of their lives. So I think it's extremely important that they learn how to be thinkers and question stuff um, and not just, you know, take stuff on its face value. Right. Very important skill to have. Key word thinkers. 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 Yep. Um, that, that, that thinkers. We need thinkers. Tell me what's Absolutely. What All right. So this is the first picture of that. This They actually did this live, as you can see, on National Geographic. I think it was 2002, maybe. They decided they, they saw some openings in the what they call the Queen's Chamber in the Great Pyramid. And uh, this is what they found. So what you're looking at there is those two pieces that look like they're kind of hanging there towards the top. That's actually copper. And uh, there, there's a better picture of it up close. Actually, they found it in two chambers. This must be, this might be the one from the other chamber. But they found them in two chambers, and you can kind of see, like that might be erosion there. Um, but if you look at it from a scientific point of view, um, like a battery, it could possibly have a, you know, a positive and a negative charge going on there. I mean, why else would you put copper wiring right there like that? I mean, I, I can't see any other reason why you would do that. Wow. What's this? That is, so that's what the pyramid's sitting on top of. Um, it's sitting on top of an aquifer, which is limestone. So anytime you got running water, you can generate electrical current. Um, simple experiment. You know, sometimes they do it in science class. You can literally just take an LED light 
and divide a stream of water like coming out of a faucet and you put the LED light under the divided water and the, the light will light up. Um, so not only is it an aquifer it's over top of, but it's also limestone, which increases the electric, uh, electrical conduct. So uh, they build on top of an aquifer and this is done not just here, but uh, in South America, um, a lot of those temples are built on aquifers just like this. So it's, these aren't the only people that decide to do this. And uh, I mean, she got all this stuff that has to do with electricity and it's built on top of an aquifer as well. Um, you know, stuff starts adding up here. You're like, you know, what, why is this not even, you know, there's nothing about it in textbooks or mainstream history or anything. Um, this stuff starts to add up. Hmm. What about, <clears throat> let me find the spot here. All right, that's a that's a that's a little bit out of order. Um, How about that? There we go. There it is. Okay. So anybody who's seen um, ancient aliens or anything, I mean, I, personally, I don't believe that aliens helped them. I believe they did this on their own. But anybody who's seen that show has seen this. Uh, what they call the ley lines, and what those are, they are the lines for the telluric current that runs throughout the Earth, which is just underground electricity. All right. Now, right on that, where they intersect, right there. That is where the pyramids are. Um, so you add that in there too. I mean, they just happened to, I mean, that technically you could argue that's coincidence, right? I mean, of course that's possible, but to have all this stuff we just looked at before, and then on top of that, put it right smack dab in the middle of an intersection of two ley lines like that. I mean, we were talking before, George, there's the, uh, I could have picked a better graphic for that, but they're all over the world. And a lot of megalithic, ancient sites are on these ley lines. Um, they obviously knew something about electrical current in the earth. I mean, technically, could you say that's coincidence? Yeah, you could. But um, to me, it just, I don't consider it coincidence. But, <clears throat> but for people all around the world to build these structures in these particular places, right? Uh, the odds of that happening just out of coincidence is, is uh, out of this world, right? Yeah, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty close to impossible. It is. So just give me your, your, your thoughts. They, they build them on these ley lines. Right. They serve no purpose as far as a tomb is concerned. Correct. And they had no hieroglyphics, no writings, no nothing in, on the inside. What do you think they were for? If I'm looking at all this stuff again over the years, I, I definitely believe that they were used for some kind of um, electrical purpose. Uh, when you look at all the evidence, I mean, I think it's pretty hard not to come to that conclusion. Um, I mean, if I let's put it this way, if I gave the kids an assignment, right, I said, here's some evidence on the pyramids being energy sources. Here's an assignment on them being tombs. OK, the kids that I gave the, the assignment to about the energy source part would get a better grade. They would literally have more evidence than the kids that were doing an assignment about them being tombs. Wow. Ed? Fascinating stuff. So, yeah, I, I have heard people have said that uh, aliens did the uh, pyramids, and they've also said that um, they were largely created by Jewish slaves or Hebrews at the time. Um, so, right. What do you think about that? So, this is actually surprising. Um, there's a mainstream lesson by the uh, DBQ project, the Document Based Question Project, that actually provides evidence that <clears throat> uh, slaves did not build the Great Pyramid and the others right around it at Giza. So it's not like they didn't build them at all because they did, but these particular pyramids, the people that built them were buried with um, artifacts and stuff and they were given a proper burial and they didn't do that for slaves. So, I mean, there's, a, there's literally a mainstream 
lesson about that. Um, they definitely did build them. These particular pyramids, though, uh, I don't think so. I do not. If they didn't, who did? Hmm. <laughs> I just, man, I, I really think these people knew a lot. I think they were using a lot more of their brains than we do. I mean, think about it, too. We have so many more distractions today. I mean, they were just sitting there. They didn't have TV and news and Facebook and all. They were just sitting around thinking about stuff. <laughs> so they weren't being dumbed down by a lot of the stuff we have today. I really think they they were using a lot of their brain and figuring a lot of stuff out on their own. It's possible. It's very possible. That's possible. That's a good point. That's a good, yeah. good point. No so, not. so, Ed, the Hebrew slaves <clears throat> built as you were saying on one hand, and Alex, if, if the Hebrew slaves didn't build these things, these electric, let me call them electrical towers, uh, just to break it down, <clears throat> who, who, who built them in other parts of the world? Like down in South America, you can find them. Uh, oh, yeah. In Asia, you can find you find them all over the world, and they're sitting on them ley lines. Uh, who built these things? Each each tribe uh, is that is that who built them, or was was? So are you asking me? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> um, here's a here's a possible explanation. Um, in, uh, I think, it, late 90s, early 2000s, they actually found Mayan inscriptions inside one of the pyramids in Egypt, all right? And they had indigenous people from uh, the Mayan tradition come and verify them, and they did. So there's Mayan inscriptions in Egypt, all right? So you could obviously suggest that they were in some kind of contact, and uh, the ancient Egyptian word for water is Maya. So it's, I'm just, this is the theory, but they could have got their name from the Egyptians, you know, as the people that came across the water or something like that. I mean, that's a theory, but the fact is they found Mayan inscriptions in Egypt. So, I mean, obviously they didn't get there by accident. So it's quite possible. You know, we, we don't know how far back people were in communication. We really don't. A lot of stuff's still coming out right now. Um, there's lots of civilizations that still have to be investigated uh, in the Amazon for one. I mean, there's it's 7 million square miles. We've torn down about a million and a half of it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we don't, we still uh, under the water too. I mean, there's so much stuff out there. I mean, people can do their own research on this, this subject. There's so much out there that we haven't even investigated yet. Scott Middleton says they found three on the North pole. Three what? Pyramids, I guess. Or... I haven't heard that, but I wouldn't doubt it. So, if they find uh, from the beers wording in Egypt, and that causes someone to stop and think, no, wait a minute. South America is a long ways off from Egypt, correct? Sure is. Mm -hmm. How did the Mayans get to Egypt, or how did the Egyptians? You know what I'm. You know what I'm asking. I mean, I, I, abs we, I absolutely know. Um, yeah. I know the Polynesians were were before what we're talking about right now, but I mean they they literally navigated the Pacific Ocean with nothing but the stars, um, and basically overrated canoes i mean it's not like they were on these 50 foot yachts sailing i mean they were literally just like catamarans um so it's just uh i just i don't see any reason to rule it out um you know yeah so and and i've often wondered about that <clears throat> you know if, if pete lives way over there and harry lives way down there and as far as our little little mind is concerned, uh, yes, Ed, I opened my door up for that one. Uh, I, <laughs> I deserve whatever you give me. But when we think, no, way back then, 
Pete couldn't possibly go see Harry, and Harry couldn't possibly go see Pete. But somehow, some way, those things just didn't end up there and back here again. Somebody had to get from point A to point B and from point B back to point A, right? Right, right. So I can, I can see where in a classroom, if the teacher laid this stuff out for me, I can see where I would get a spark. Uh, that I did it again because they'd given me that look. I would get a spark. And that would that would really that would really turn my crank and want to find out some stuff, which would lead to more questions. And by the time it's all over with, Alex, do you agree? We end up with more questions than we do answers. Exactly. Um, and that's, you know, when it gets to that point, I don't even have to do much. You know, the kids just go and they ask questions and they get they get into it. They start uh, debating with each other. Um, you know, it's a uh, it's really cool. It's, it's a cool experience. I, I love it when they're interested in the stuff. It's uh, it's just awesome. And it's there's not a lot of people that um, I got to be honest, I'm, I'm dual certified. So one of them is is uh, social studies and. Uh, I, I didn't uh, really get into the, the Western or Eastern or Western Civ as far as that goes. I, I would rather, you know, for me, I, I, I like getting into the, um, you know, the social sciences that are other than the, the hardcore uh, history. I, I, you know, I like, you know, talking and comparing things and contrasting things and getting into deep discussions. But there's probably not a lot of people that are um, that, like you said, the college textbooks are limited in their descriptions. So there's probably not right. a lot of people coming, coming out of college or teaching these uh, types of things with, unless they were uh, in, like in your case, inspired to do it. So it's kind of uh, I think that makes you pretty unique. <laughs> I, I appreciate hearing that. That's uh, you know, it, it seems natural, you know, it seems natural to do stuff like this. Um, yeah. It, it it is most amazing. Uh, now, I used to, and I and I haven't had time. I just haven't had time uh, for almost the last year now. To sit down and watch. But I used to peek in on that ancient aliens and things, you know. Uh, yep. And it would it it would cause my brain housing group to spin sometimes. Because some of the things that they were saying, you stop, you think, you know, that makes that makes a lot of sense. And and I've heard that before, uh, where these particular people, they found their writings way over here. And yep. I heard that stuff before, and I, I've always thought, how do they do that? So man had to be much more intelligent and use much more of his brain <laughs> than than we do today. And I, I think you hit the nail right on the head, Alex. They didn't have Facebook. They didn't have they didn't have all these distractions that we have today. So they sat around and they thought. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. Wow. And I I can see in a classroom where that would that would light it up. Scott would, Scott uh, Middleton said it won't let him share the photos, just so you know. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I could see where that would really fire these kids up. And, and I think you're doing a fantastic job with throwing that out there. Uh, have you, have you through this particular thing that we've been talking about? Have you thrown that out to the kids in the classroom? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. If they're, if they're watching this, they're like, Oh, here goes Tasker again with his, uh, <laughs> crazy stuff. But yeah, oh, yeah, I'm telling you, they, sometimes they get sick of it. I, I talk about them so much, but, uh, yeah, they know they know very well that uh, this stuff exists and it, and it is possible. Definitely. Do um, you have a? Uh, I definitely want to get to. Do you have that next one up? I think it's got the uh, the Tesla Tower next to the uh, pyramid. Mm -hmm. Is it uh, that one? There it is. Okay, so and when I bring this up in class, I'll say. Like uh, Ed was talking about earlier, I'll say who who invented uh, 
the light bulb and who made, you know, electricity available on a huge scale. And of course they all say Thomas Edison, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'll ask them if they've ever heard of a scientist called Nikolai Tesla. And I think four or five of them around there out of all my students know who the guy even is, except for, oh, does he make the cars? Um, and of course he doesn't, they're just named after him. But uh, on the left there is his tower. Um, now, obviously that's metal and the pyramid is stone, but you can see the obvious resemblance here from the both of them. Um, now, the reason that Tesla is probably not talking about as much is because when him and Edison were basically battling for this electricity thing um, and Rockefeller was basically deciding who he wanted to fund, he went with Edison because Tesla wanted everybody to have access to this energy for free. Um, that was his plan. He wanted everybody to have it for free and Edison wanted to charge for it. So Rockefeller obviously went with the money. Um, now Tesla, uh, followed a patent in 1897, um, where he claimed that 30,000 feet up in the air, you have the ionosphere, which is rarefied air that conducts at a high voltage. And that with his tower, as you see in the picture, this is a real thing too. He did it. He conducted an experiment in July of 1903, um, eyewitnesses, all kinds of stuff. So he had filed a patent that he could wire, wirelessly transmit energy, uh, electricity through the air in the ionosphere. Um, but uh, all that stuff doesn't really get talked about because Edison gets all the credit for everything because that's where the money was. So. Wow. And, yeah. and and the picture on the right over here with the pyramid. Yeah. That that's similar to what we saw before. Exactly. Uh, yeah, with the running water underneath of it, uh, the two shafts. I mean, it's just to look at that and think they're not somehow related. I mean, it's just not a very intelligent interpretation, in my opinion. Exactly. Exactly. You know, I mean, it's pretty obvious. Wow. <laughs> you imagine if we all had free electricity, though? Yeah. Man, that that'd be, be cool, wouldn't it? That would be very nice. Wouldn't yeah. mind that at all. Right? Wow. Wow. Yeah, that'd be cool stuff. Let me put some of these comments up here. Uh, okay. Cheryl said, so glad you get excited and let your kids dig in. They need to be encouraged daily. God bless the teachers. <laughs> very and nice of you. Dylan was saying a lot. I don't know if he was. <laughs> <laughs> if he was responding to what you said or what yeah. you said. Yep. Uh, of course, Cheryl laughed to say he must have been talking to Cheryl. Uh, <laughs> Scott said I was wrong. It was Antarctica. Oh, man, Antarctica. I could I could do a whole other segment on that. I, I taught a lesson about that, too, in school. There's some crazy stuff about it at uh, Antarctica. Crazy really? stuff. We're going to have to get you to come back, Alex, because my I'll, I'll definitely come back, man. I'm having a blast doing this. This is fun. This, this, this stuff is, uh, wow. Antarctica has a treaty, treaty by many nations, and why did the Nazis go there during World War II? Uh, yeah, I mean, we could, trust me, we can go way down the rabbit hole on that one. Trust there's, me. Uh, there's a lot of stuff about that. Well, we got to We got to get you back, because I like going down that rabbit hole. Uh, okay. All uh, right. There's mom. She said, interesting. Uh, Chad said, check out Richard E. Bird that was sent after the Nazis in Antarctica when the ice melts, things will be revealed. Yes, sir. That's a very interesting account he has of when he went down there. He saw a lot of stuff that, uh, let's just say, people would call him crazy for uh, reporting it. I can leave it at that. I, I Trust me, I know all about uh, General Bird. Oh. Uh. Well, that's what we got to talk about. How about that next time you come back? That, that sounds good to me. That in on it stuff. Man, okay. Uh, where are Tesla's logs at? Where are Tesla's <laughs> logs? Like meaning his, his research right? and experiments yeah. and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, probably all his research notes and all that good stuff. Yeah, I mean, you can – that's pretty common if you just look it up. Um it's not a. Uh, it's not like it's not out there. I mean, all this stuff is out there. It's just not popular. There's wow. my cousin. I hope uh, her daughter Aubrey's in uh, world history right now. Uh, 
in her Egypt lesson. So she's going to have quite a different perspective uh, <laughs> than all the other kids. But um, yeah, that, that should be interesting. Cheryl said, let's propose a free electric boogie woogie. Uh, yeah, I know. Right now, you're going to have all, all these people trying to build little pyramids in their backyard and stuff now. <laughs> hey, let's get it to work. Uh, whatever works, you know what I'm saying? Uh, oh, man. Sure is strange that no one except military and scientists are allowed to go there. Is that talking about the Antarctica? Yes, he is. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Very strange. Wow. And so, yeah. <laughs> I guess they heard me. <laughs> so now I'm getting in trouble because I didn't, you know, give a shout out to all my family members, and we're Italian, so you know I'm going to hear about it later. Well, that's that that that's all right. <clears throat> you, you can. Uh, hey, I, I like, real quick before you uh, conclude the show, George. Uh, do you know I went my uh, my uh, father is married to an Italian woman, and she uh, we went to a funeral. And I said, uh, hey, uh, does anybody seen Tony? And everybody got up. So I just figured I, I, everybody there had the same suit on, and everybody's name was Tony. So what's up with that? <laughs> hey, Tony, Paul, yeah, Joseph. Yep. Yeah. Jimmy. There's a few um, Jimmys around. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> we, uh, do we have time to get to that uh, Washington Monument real quick? Yeah, let, let's do that while we got it. Uh Go to the uh, the big picture of it first. If you, there we go. Okay, so right in the middle of the capital of our nation, you have a giant Egyptian obelisk. All right, you have these in Rome too. Um, right in uh, St. Peter's Square. I was there over the summer with my family. Uh, amazing trip. Got to see the obelisk in person. Um, I just I think it's kind of strange that these objects, out of all of them, especially in the heart of the Catholic Church an Egyptian obelisk because um, they're so big on, you know, other symbols and stuff, not being good and all that. Um, very interesting. Um, if you bring that next one up there. So the monument itself is uh, obviously Egyptian obelisk and it's 555 feet tall. So, I mean, you can read into that if you want. Um, it's, it's very interesting though, that they chose 555 feet considering the ancient Kemet's, believed in the five stages of the sun, the five stages of consciousness and the, uh, the five houses they had. So it's strange. Um, and right there, as you, most people don't know this, it actually says, if people can read that at home, uh, on the top of the capstone, which weighs exactly 3,300 pounds in traditional, uh, Masonic numerology. Um, it says, praise God, Laos Deo in Latin on the top of the capstone, uh, in one inch lettering which I find to be uh, very interesting. Um, I know there might be some, some Freemasons watching, and uh, I know one of the requirements for membership is that you do believe in some kind of higher power or force or something like that. It um, doesn't matter which one it is. You just have to believe. So uh, I, just, I think it's really interesting that they chose obelisks in these very, very important places around the earth. Um, they're not just in Rome and in Washington, D.C., but there are other places, too. And uh, it's just it's very interesting. I would I'd, I'd love to know why they chose that. I can't seem to find the information on it, um, but definitely makes you think. And that is so I've seen articles and some research that they they could have put that monument inside the circle within the circle because that is also the uh, universal symbol for God or a higher power, um, the circumpunct symbol. That's where we get the term punctuation from as well. Um, it's just a simple circle with a dot in it, if you have that one too, the next picture. Right, that's the ancient symbol for God, then it got moved on to gold and all this stuff, but there's creation in the middle, and then everything um, around it, and it's a circle, because everything they believe everything was in cycles. Um, so you could make that argument. That's a bit of a stretch, but, uh, technically the monument is located in a circle within a circle, just like that symbol. So you can think of that what you want. Wow. Hmm. How's your brain housing group holding up, Ed? Well, uh, it's doing just fine. I, you know, it's, uh, like I said, it's, it's interesting. Uh, and it's, there's not a lot of people that, um, 
you know, there's not a lot of mainstream, as, as uh, Mr. Tasker has already mentioned, not a lot of that going on that's t- teaching about this. And I think it's fascinating because, like we always say, you know, history in particular is kind of dry without, you know, doing things like what he's doing in terms of all the uh, all the extra stuff that's fascinating and it's and, and it makes you ask questions. You know, the, the why makes things a lot more interesting than the that's. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Alex, you know that you, you got, you got Dylan stirred up next door. (laughs) Yes. Yes. I know that. I'm going to be, I'm going to have to deal with him for the next several hours now. (laughs) (laughs) Which is good. Which is good. Which is good. I love it when he, when he comes alive like that. I can't thank you enough. I can't thank you enough, my brother. I really can't. Uh, Thanks for having me on, man. This was I really had a great time. This was fun. Oh, it was fun. Look, we got to get you back. Uh, oh, I'm in. I'm in. That Antarctica thing is is uh, man. Let's go there. Let's yeah, I might. I don't know if I'll tell too many people we're doing that one, but that's man. That that one. You think this stuff is crazy? That stuff goes way down the rabbit hole. There's a lot of interesting stuff in Antarctica. So, yeah, yeah. I'd definitely be. Uh, that would be that would be cool. Let let let's go down that rabbit hole. Let's, uh, All right. There, there, there's uh, there's so many things that goes on that we that we have no idea. Uh, we're just moving faster than a speeding bullet. Maybe not so much now since since we've been slowed down, shut down, and all those other things. Uh, this gives us a time to to stop, ponder, reflect, and think. Uh, so sure yeah, does. definitely want you to come back. I had a ball. Uh, Ed, your final thoughts. No, it's a great time. Like I said, uh, this is interesting, and uh, you know, it's, it's always good to have a teacher on because teachers like to teach. They enjoy what they're doing. They, it's 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 a, it's a comfort zone for him, and it's a, a lot of people listening. They probably are fascinated, just like I am, and uh, because it's just rare. It's refreshing. It's rare. It's interesting, and like I said, it makes you. It forces you to say why and what if. And that's when things happen, when we say why and what if. Or maybe Absolutely. I could. Yeah, or maybe I could. So, fantastic. Thank you, Alex. Thank you so very, very much. Uh, Thank you, guys. Look, I'll get up with you. We, we was talking before we were on the air. I'll get up with you about that. Uh, and just just call me at any time. Just, just call okay. me. And, uh and, and, and we'll get all this other stuff figured out and make it happen, okay? Cool. Sounds good to me. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, friends, Romans and countrymen, I hope that you enjoyed this this afternoon because I sure did. And I hope that it blew the dust off our brain housing group. And whether you're down the street, around the corner, across America, or somewhere around this great big world, thank you so very, very much for putting up with me And looking in on Ed, and most of all, we thank Mr. Alex Tasker for being here. Wow, I had a blast. Let's get those watch parties going. Send it out near, far, and wide. We'll put the audio up. We'll put the videos up. You know, the whole routine. Share it into your news stream. You get places where we can't go, but put it out there and tell everybody. Near, far, and wide, if you didn't see it live, go watch it. Go watch it because it will really get you thinking. Thank you, everyone, for all of your comments, for all the things that you did. Thank you for your kind words. Thank you for your support. And until next time, I trust and pray that God will keep you right in the center of his hand. See you later, Alex. See you later, Ed. See you, guys. Bye, everybody. I hope that you enjoyed that. Now, if you really want to get the full effects, do this. Go to Facebook and type in The George Espenlaub Show. The George Espenlaub Show. That's E-S-P-E-N-L-A-U-B. The George Espenlaub Show. And you can go to our show page. And you can see all 
of the videos, all the shows that we have done by live stream. This being the last one that we did, you'll see it first. So take the time. We put overlays up as Alex was talking to us, pictures that people could see, and he was explaining them. Uh, it might get a little difficult on the radio, <clears throat> but we wanted to give you a taste of what it was like yesterday afternoon <clears throat> when we had Alex on with us. So take the time, go to Facebook, type in the search box, The George Espinlob Show. It'll take you there. And you can see this for yourself. Interesting. Very, very interesting. A brilliant young man. We're going to have Alex come back again. <clears throat> it won't be too many weeks from now. We're going to have him come back again. And we're going to have a very interesting subject with him. It should be intriguing, thrilling, and all those things. But most of all, it'll make you think. Wow. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, thank you for tuning in tonight. I really appreciate it. Remember, email me, georgece at comcast.net. That's georgece at comcast.net. Go to the espenblog.com, the espenblog.com. <clears throat> there you can read about everything. So from me and all the gang here at the Funny Farm, Thank you for taking the time to tune in tonight, whether you're down the street, around the corner, across America, or yes, somewhere around this great big world. Thank you. Regardless of where you're at and regardless of what time it is, if it's daytime, you have a great and wonderful day. If it's nighttime, you have a very pleasant night. But... Remember this, love one another, be kind one to another, take care of one another, and please, don't ever be afraid to tell someone that you love them. It could possibly save a life. So until next time, and there will be a next time, if the good Lord's willing and the crooks don't rise, until next time. This is me saying to you, good night, have a great time, may God keep you right in the center of his hand. Good night, everybody.